Hi, and welcome to the Core Stratagem gameplay tutorial. This video will guide you through the basics of how to play Core Stratagem, introducing the user interface, game concepts like cities and units, and how to control the game. This tutorial is geared toward players who are new to turn-based strategy games. If you've got some experience with games like Civilization, Advance Wars, or Strategic Conquest, you can probably skim through this video, or even skip it entirely. Core Stratagem is a game of exploration and conquest. You are the supreme military commander of your faction, and your goal is to build up your forces, explore the map, and defeat your enemies, the other players controlled by the computer. Each player begins the game in control of one city. There are additional neutral cities scattered about the landscape, which you will have to discover and capture with your units so that you can put them to use. Cities are where you build your units. So the more cities you control, the faster you can build up your forces and the better off you'll be. Now that we've introduced the basic concept of the game, let's examine the interface. At the top left is the message panel, which will keep a record of all the events that happen throughout your game. Some of these notifications will be marked by an asterisk. These are events that happened at a specific location on the map that you can see. You can double-click these messages to zoom right to the location being reported. To the right of the message panel are the city counters. In Core Stratagem, you can always see how many cities each player controls, even if you haven't discovered them yet. This helps you have an idea where everyone stands, who you should attack, and how well you're doing. The Days counter tells you what turn of the game you're on. Core Stratagem is a turn-based game, which means that each player gets as much time as they need to give orders until each unit and city is accounted for. Then the next player acts. During each player's turn, only that player's units can move around the map and attack other units or capture cities. A quick game on a small-sized map like this one will typically take between 60 and 80 turns. A huge map with five or six players on it may take hours of gameplay hundreds of turns to complete. Moving on, let's skip down to the bottom left of the screen, where we see the city list. Here, all the cities you own are listed, along with a shorthand for what unit is being produced there, and how many days until the unit is complete. You can click on a city from the list in order to select it, or double-click it in order to bring up the city's build menu. We'll discuss the build menu in detail a little later. Next to the city list is the mini-map, which gives you an overview of the territory you've discovered. Cities are displayed as squares of the owner's color. As you can see, my color is blue, the enemy is red. Neutral cities, like this one, are displayed as gray. Once you've discovered a city, you will always know who owns it, even if you didn't see it get captured. You can click on the mini-map in order to zoom your view around the battlefield. Next is the Selected Tile panel. When you click on a tile on the main map screen, any friendlies in that space, including cities, buildings, and units, will be listed in this panel. You can click on them to choose which you would like to activate and give orders to. As in the city list, double-clicking a city will bring up the city's build menu. When you have a friendly unit selected, its image appears in the Active Peace panel, along with a summary of its current condition. In Core Stratagem, each unit is defined by a few basic statistics. Strength measures how much damage the unit can take before it's destroyed. Power is how much damage it can dish out in combat. And each unit gets a certain number of moves and a certain number of attacks each turn before it can no longer act. Moving a unit to an adjacent tile usually costs one move. Attacking an enemy or capturing a city uses up both an attack and a move. Finally, on the bottom right is the control panel. At the top are two large arrow buttons that allow you to scroll through the units that you need orders before you can end your turn. The center button with the exclamation point will briefly show a flashing alert pointing out where each of these units is. The rest of the control panel will change based on whether your active piece is a unit or a city. 
On the unit control panel, you have access to common orders such as board of transport, patrol, wait one turn, seek repairs, open unit hold for transport units, and sleep. The last row of buttons are for automation, while some of the earlier orders like repair and board will put a unit on automatic until a certain condition is reached, fully automated units will act independently until you give them a new order. Most of the time they'll stop and ask for a command if they encounter an enemy, but if you end your turn anyway they'll just act in accordance with their standing orders. There are three types of automation for units. On guard duty, units will try to protect their general area from enemy attack. On aggressive mode, Units will actively seek out and destroy enemy units, and capture cities if they're able to. Transport units placed on aggressive will pick up and drop off units automatically, trying to move your forces into attack positions. Units set on explore will try to reveal undiscovered territory. If you have a city selected rather than a unit, the control panel changes to a city control panel. Here, this large button displays what the city is building and how many days until it's finished. The next button toggles whether the city should just keep repeating its current build queue instead of asking for new orders every time something finishes. The next row of buttons allow you to set the city's destination waypoints for each type of unit. You can have a different destination for land units, sea units, and air units, and newly constructed units of those types will move to their appropriate destination as soon as they're finished. You can also give newly built units automatic orders using the last row of buttons. The M is for manual control, meaning new units will not be given any automation. The shield and sword are the same as before, guard and aggressive. You can also have new land units immediately begin looking for a transport to board. Now while we have a city selected, let's describe the build menu that we've been skirting around. As mentioned before, in order to open a city's build menu, we can double-click its name in the city list, or in the selected tile panel, click the building button on the control panel, or we can simply double-click the city on the main map. The build menu allows you to manage what units your city builds. At the top is the city's name, which you can edit if you'd like to rename the city. Next is a list of what units are available for construction there. As you click through the list, the selected unit's description and stats will be shown below. Double-clicking the unit's name in the list, or hitting the queue button, will queue up the unit for construction. You can queue up a long list of units this way, change the order in which they'll be built, and so on. Some of the same functions from the control panel are duplicated on the build menu as well. You can have your city replete its build queue, or give new units automated orders. The final part of the interface is the End Turn button. If you have units who still need to act before your turn can end, the End Turn button will turn yellow and indicate how many still need orders. When all of your units have their orders, the button will turn green, and you can set your units into motion by clicking it. When all your units have finished acting, the other players will take their turns, and your next turn will begin. Now let's talk about navigating around the map and giving units orders. To move your view around, you can click on the mini-map, as described before, click the middle mouse button on the main screen, or as long as you don't have a unit selected, you can click and drag on the main map. You can zoom in and out with the mouse wheel. To give a unit orders, you must first select it. Units who need orders will be shown with a white outline. Units who have not moved yet, but already have orders to carry out, will display a white ellipsis overhead. To select a unit, click on it. Your selected unit ready for orders will be surrounded by a flashing yellow highlight. Once you have a unit selected, its picture and stats will appear in the active piece panel, and the unit control panel will appear to the right. To give a unit an order, you simply right-click the mouse on the tile you want it to move to, or click and drag the mouse on the map to its destination. 
If you give an order this way, you'll see roughly the path the unit will take and how many tiles away the destination is. This is especially useful if the unit in question uses fuel, which we'll discuss later on. You can also give commands using the keyboard. Select Controls from the Help menu for more information about this. When you encounter an enemy unit, you can give your own unit's attack orders the same way as move orders. Simply right-click on the enemy, or click and drag over it, and your unit will attack. If your selected unit has a ranged attack, like this artillery, enemy units in range will be surrounded by a flashing red highlight. Attacking an enemy can have three outcomes. On a full success, your unit will do its full power value of damage to the enemy unit, and suffer no harm. On a partial success, or heated battle, both attacker and defender will deal half damage to each other. On a failed attack, the attacker is repelled and takes half damage from the defender. Units making ranged attacks cannot be counterattacked in this way, and instead will simply miss the target. If your unit can capture cities, simply moving into a neutral or enemy city will bring the city under your control. The city will immediately bring up its build menu, allowing you to decide what should be constructed there. If the city belonged to an enemy player, you'll also see what they were building before you captured it. If you want, you can choose to finish their project and use it against them. This can give you access to units you couldn't otherwise control, and a well-timed capture can turn the tide of a campaign. Keep in mind that this goes both ways. If the enemy captures your city one turn away from completing a battleship, you will be seeing that battleship on your doorstep very soon. When you've fully explored a landmass, you'll want to transport some of your land units across the water to another island to continue your conquest. You can give your land units board orders, and they'll automatically seek out transports, waking up when the transport's ready to drop them off. Or you can manually move them onto transport units simply by ordering them into the transport's tile. With a transport selected, the active piece panel displays the unit's current and total hold capacity. When you're ready to unload your transported units, select the transport and hit the open hold button. The transport will also automatically open if it ends its turn next to an unconquered island. Then move your units onto land and begin your conquest. In addition to assigning orders to your units individually, you can use the automation menu to automate entire branches of your army. You can have all of your land, sea, or air units fully automated, allowing your AI deputy to assign their orders. Units who encounter enemies will still stop and wait for your commands until they're out of danger, but will otherwise act completely independently. You can also choose to automate all of your transport units, or all of your detonating units, which are a special unit type we'll discuss later. You can automate all of your construction, or even your entire army. Setting your forces to fully automatic and watching the game play out is a pretty good way to get a handle on how a game of CS plays. However, note that if your forces are fully automated, they will not stop for your orders when encountering enemies or for any other reason. Even if you have your transport units automated, you can still influence their behavior using boarding and landing beacons. By placing these beacons on land tiles, you can designate targeted areas for picking up and dropping off units. Land units with orders to board transports will automatically seek out nearby boarding beacons, and transports with units to drop off will move to the nearest landing beacon. You can remove old beacons by placing them again. These beacons are useful if, for example, you want to pick up units on a strip of land that's far away from friendly port cities, or if you want to focus your assaults on a specific enemy island or come from a strategically advantageous angle. As your units defeat enemies, they gain experience and will eventually earn promotions. Whenever a unit is promoted, it gains a boost to a random stat as well as a slight bonus in all future combats. Units can be promoted up to three times. 
Some units require fuel to act. Any time a unit with a fuel supply spends a move, including attempting an attack, it spends one unit of fuel as well. For example, this fighter has a total fuel capacity of 20 units, and a current supply of 16, as displayed in this corner of the active piece panel. This means it can take 16 more actions before it runs out of fuel and crashes. In order to stay alive, it must return to a friendly city or a special refueling unit like an aircraft carrier before its fuel runs out. Most but not all aircraft in Core Stratagem require fuel. Most but not all land and sea units do not. With a fuel using unit selected, you'll see the limits of its current range displayed as this transparent yellow overlay. Some units in Core Stratagem, like this submarine, are considered stealth units. They are permanently hidden from the enemy, allowing them to move unseen and perform sneak attacks. Stealth units are not revealed by attacking, but if they are attacked by the enemy, they'll be revealed until the start of their next turn. You can also build special detector units, like this destroyer, that will automatically reveal any enemy stealth units they encounter. There's one last special unit type in CS. Certain units can detonate, destroying themselves along with everything in the blast radius. This bomb drone is an example of a detonating unit. With a detonating unit selected, the unit's blast radius will be shown in the active piece panel here. A unit with a blast radius of zero will destroy everything in the hex where it detonates. A radius of one will destroy everything within one space of ground zero and so on. Cities caught in a detonation will be evacuated, reverting to neutral ownership. To detonate this bomb drone, we can simply move it into the enemy city. Bomb drones can be intercepted by enemy attack aircraft. Other types of detonating units have their own weaknesses. When a unit is severely damaged, its statistics may begin to suffer as a result. A unit marked with a red asterisk has had its strength reduced to less than half its base value. When this happens, all of its other statistics are limited to the unit's current strength. For example, this tank has a base strength of 3, but its current strength is only 1. As a result, instead of 2 moves per turn and 3 power, both of these values are reduced to 1 as well. To repair a damaged unit, move it into a friendly city. Each turn a unit spends inside your city, it will recover one point of strength. You can also use the Seek Repair order to send your unit to the nearest city automatically. It will stay there until fully restored and then wake up ready for new orders. Let's talk briefly about unit stacking in CS. Stacking means having more than one unit occupy the same space on the map. For the most part, Land and air units can stack with no problems. Tanks, artillery, and aircraft can all occupy the same space in any numbers without any issue. If there are multiple units in one tile, their numbers will be indicated by a set of colored pips at the bottom of the hex. A stack two units deep will have two pips, and so on. This applies to both friendly and enemy units, although you will not see stack indicator pips to show enemy stealth units that you haven't detected. For the most part, C units do not stack. Only one ship can occupy a given space at any time. Likewise, only one transport unit of each type can occupy the same space. So, a lifter and a transport can coexist, but two lifters could not. Inside friendly cities, none of these stacking rules apply. All friendly units stack inside your cities, meaning you can have as many ships and as many transport units as you want inside. However, don't go thinking this means you can just stack up battleships and defend any city indefinitely. Sea units always take double damage in combat while they're inside your cities, to reflect how vulnerable they are while they're in dry dock. Terrain in core stratagem can have powerful effects on the battlefield. Open land and sea aren't anything special while mountain tiles are accessible only by aircraft. Wetlands are accessible to any unit, but land and sea units traveling through them will be slowed. Moving into or out of a wetland tile costs them two moves instead of one. 
Additionally, land units mired in wetlands will suffer a slight combat penalty, making them easier to defeat. Land units in forests will be slowed down as well, but the cover of the trees will hide them from enemies, granting them a temporary stealth. The cover also provides a slight combat bonus. You can hover your mouse over terrain or over units to get more information about them. And now to our final topic. The biggest change in the new 1.1 update to the game is the introduction of buildable stationary structures. These are selected for building from your city's build menu, just like ordinary units. They get to move once, to a tile next to their home city, and then they're permanently fixed in place. A newly completed structure appears in the city as a construction unit, like this crane truck. When you have a ready-to-play structure selected, valid locations for constructions will flash a green silhouette of the completed building. Note that land-based structures can be built in forested tiles, but this will remove the forest. Orange silhouettes indicate that you can place your building on this site, but it will replace the existing structure there. Invalid locations will simply not display anything. Each faction gets two special unique structures, one of which is a defense emplacement, and another which may be a different type of defense, or something a little more unique. All factions can also build academies, workshops, airfields, and dockyards. Academies grant free experience to units built in the host city. Workshops, dockyards, and airfields boost construction speed in the attached city for land, sea, and air units, respectively. These bonuses are cumulative. Three academies will grant new units an immediate promotion, and a city with six adjacent tiles occupied by workshops will produce land units at double speed. Defensive structures will not ask for orders every turn. They will only wake up if there is a detected enemy in range of their attack. This concludes the video tutorial for Core Strategy. Thanks for watching, and good luck on the battlefield.